like to um, introduce the next speaker, Maria Freer. Um, we go back a long way, good grief, uh, when we were both at the University of Maryland. Uh, Maria is now president and the executive director and member of the board of directors of the foundation of the National Institutes of Health. Um, she's been there since uh, last year. She, uh, she will tell us about it because I don't think many of us know much about the foundation. Prior to that, she was the president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation, and we all know about that foundation. Um, and she also worked uh, with the Global Alliance for TV Drug Development, which is very laudable. So let's hear from you, Maria, about this, uh, new found this foundation that you're now the Thank you. Thank you. It's fun to be here this morning. It's fun to hear Alice. I think most of us in the room were listening to what you had to say and thinking, yeah, that's happened to me. <laughs> oh, yes, I know about that. Um, as Rita said, we go back a long way, and uh, we've probably seen a lot of that. The most recent example, and I'm diverting from my path here of looking into the future, the, the most recent example, Alice, you'd be um, amused, I think, is I am now a member of a public company board, something I'd never done before. And of course, I'm the only woman in the room, right? I mean, there aren't any other women, except there's another woman in the room. And I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting. But she's not a member of the board. It turns out she's the attorney for the company. And so just said to the CEO one day, you know, I said, by the way, what about Jennifer? How come you have all these senior named, uh, you know, people on the uh, on the board as as the, um, the there's a special category that that uh, companies have for their named executives, and she wasn't a named executive. And he said, oh, you know, I, six months later, the next board meeting. Uh, we get a, uh, a notice that they're, in fact, making Jennifer a, a named executive. And uh, it was like, and he said, to his credit, the CEO said, it was because Maria asked the question. And I had never thought about that. And I thought, wow, if I, I didn't know it was that easy. So um, I'm sure it had a lot to do with how good she is. Uh, but anyway, so yes, let's start asking the question. I have, um, yeah, I have feedback, right? Got it? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the foundation for the NIH. And um, in <laughs> I realize that uh, most people don't know it exists. And Janet Rowley. <laughs> we were talking earlier, and I was th uh, Janet Rowley just died, for those of you who do not know, the Philadelphia chromosome. She did remarkable work. University of Chicago and Rita and I were talking at the beginning, and um, we couldn't remember the name. And I said, I'll blurt it out in the middle of the talk, and sure enough, there it is. So I want to um, is sort of describe the landscape of how I see the biomedical enterprise today where we fit as a foundation, and maybe give some thoughts of the world according to Maria, which you will realize is flawed by definition because, of course, it is biased. So um, we can all read these, but they are some big, big issues that we face today. I got to tell you, I have not seen this much excitement in biomedical sciences as I see today. It is awesome, and you hear it from everybody, including, interestingly enough, from pharmaceutical companies that I thought would be down on it. But they're not. They're very, very excited about the science. We have, um, we also realize that this enterprise, it's not no longer a, um, an individual play. This really is a huge enterprise, and it takes more than one person, more than one group to have to be part of this. Science has become really a team sport because you need biology, you need um, mathematics, you need computational science. So it's a very different playing field from when I got my, my PhD, frankly, where you would go to your lab bench and you do, would do your work. It's certainly much bigger and much more interactive. They've, because of this, we've created high expectations, and yet the funding, as we know, is 
ebbing. And I'm not saying stopping because for those of us who have been around for a while, we know that it goes in cycles. You may remember that the 1980s, the beginning of the 80s were particularly bad, and then you'll remember that the mid-90s were particularly bad. And it is my hope that now that we see this retrenching, now that we see sequestration going into play, now that we see um, shutdown of governments and curtailing of grants, and, and Francis makes an impassioned plea for what's happening to the the, the NIH and certainly to the NSF and the FDA and all of this. I'm hoping that it's, that this will too will come back. However, what's, what we have to understand is that we're now global players and there are other actors in this field. And so this idea that the United States is the leader in biomedical research, that the United States will continue to do the best uh, science to reflect on the patient and reflect on the population, is is going to be challenged. It's going to be, we, we see the numbers in China, we see the numbers in Brazil, we see, we see different players um, coming into this space. And so the issue for us is how do we take advantage of this new global architecture? What are the advantages of being in this different um, way of moving technology forward? But importantly, how do we either adapt or how do we become the leaders in, in this new way? So from where I sit, my sense is that we really have to find very clever and very different ways of conducting science and to be cost effective and have strategies that are sustainable. Different landscape, different ways of doing business. So, um, you know, everybody talks about public-private partnerships. <laughs> It is a passe term, I am here to tell you. This term we were using in the early 2000s. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and give you, give you some examples of public-private partnerships because I need to figure out a new term. Uh, it's overused, two people with a handshake is called a public-private partnership. And I actually went and did research and the first mention of public-private partnerships was in the 1940s in the UK uh, where uh, the government and the uh, and companies got together. However, in the in the health arena, there are about 70 to 80 of these public-private partnerships, and they achieve different goals. So, Rita mentioned that I was um, working as the CEO of uh, the Global Alliance, in which we develop medicines for tuberculosis, which was an amazing, amazing enterprise. Nevertheless, we have groups that generate uh, research, like ADNI, I'll say a couple words about that. Uh, access to health products, Gavi. Um, we have health strengthening campaigns for infrastructure, and we have regulatory um, quality and standards. All of these you may recognize. So I'm going to go back one slide to tell you from my definition of uh, having been involved, by the way, in the interest of full disclosure on ADNI now, TV Alliance, I'm, a board, I'm on the board of Gavi. I want to be nowhere near the Global Fund because it's far too complicated for my brain. But um, so I've seen these. I've seen these upfront and personal. So let's go back to what they are. First thing is they are a mechanism. They're not a goal in and of itself. And I think people get confused by this. They say, we're going to form a public-private partnership as if that were where you need to be. It's simply a means to an end. And so having a, an understanding of the common purpose, a clear, well-defined goals and milestones is really what a public-private partnership is about. What do you want to do? It has to have multiple contributors. So as I was saying before, it's a matrix, but the matrix become much bigger than the simple sum of the parts. And of course, there's representatives from, from the different sectors. Now the key, of course, is you can't find, um, get these movement goings without knowing and understanding that you need to mobilize resources. And I don't only mean funds, I mean people, I mean uh, policy, I mean scientific innovation. So you really have to have different groups that come together with shared or different sets of skills that complement each other. And for this to succeed, and I'm spending some time on this because I, 
I'm going to give you examples of where the foundation, how the foundation has used this. What is particularly important is that you have to figure out what the road map is. You have to figure out what the governance rules are. You have to understand when you join the club, if you're going to be able to publish, of what the issues of intellectual property are going to be. So you don't decide this at the end of the journey. You sit down and you establish the rules at the beginning of the, of the journey. And that's not as simple as it sounds because you may decide or people may decide from one of these sectors that they simply don't want to buy, buy let's use an example, intellectual property, which is particularly <coughs> thorny. If you say there's going to be no patents filed, you may find that a lot, a lot of the people will leave the room. And that's fine as long as you understand the rules. So, in, um, so where does the, how does the foundation for NIH fit in? And, and, uh, notice the tagline, it's building these partnerships for the discovery and the innovation to improve health. So the foundation was uh, founded, it was congressionally mandated. It's interesting. Um, I didn't know about this and I don't expect many of you know about this, but it is a congressionally mandated foundation. It's a 501c3, so it has the same rules as any other foundation, but it turns out um, and I learned this after I became president uh, of the foundation, <laughs> much to my embarrassment. Turns out that you can write checks to the federal government. Anybody can, and frankly, we you know, I'm sure Francis will welcome receiving a check from you for the NIH. And people do that. Grateful patients will do that. People that want, uh, you know, to support a particular agency will do that. The thing is that once you do that, the money goes into the agency and it is the same as appropriated funds, which means you have no, you the donor have no control over how the agency is going to use that money. Because you can imagine that if you're a corporation and you give money to an agency, the immediate understanding is that you will use that for purposes of the corporation, and that's not going to work. So the minute your money goes into the gift funds, those are appropriated do dollars, and there's no quid pro quo. The only group that can tell an agency what to do with the money is Congress. House of Representatives, to be precise, but the Senate needs to be part of the, of the dance, except for the foundation of NIH. And that's the important link, you see, because Congress gave the foundation for NIH, created the foundation for NIH in order for us to be able to petition funds. We can have agreements with industry. We can talk to donors. Uh, federal employees cannot solicit funds. We can. And the reason that this is powerful is because then we go to the NIH. We can never tell NIH what to do, and we wouldn't purport that we can do that. But we will say, this money comes for diabetes. What do you have in diabetes, and how do you want to use these funds in diabetes? And so I'll get the head of the institute saying, ah, very interesting. I have this new program in diabetes, and these funds can be used for this, this, and that. And then we go back to the donor and say, does this make sense? And the donor says, yeah, I, I like that, or no, I'm not so sure about that. And we continue the, the dance. And sometimes we're not successful. The majority of the time, we're very successful. So it allows NIH and it allows donors to embark in public-private partnerships that otherwise wouldn't have been possible because of the structure of government. And it allows NIH not to take orders from you know, anybody else other than themselves and bring the money along to the rules. If the monies come in and they're going to be dispersed, they go through the peer review process, for example, or we may position them in, in a different structure. So the foundation in that sense has been very helpful. It's brought in about $700 million, and the biggest chunk came from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They gave the foundation $300, $200 million for the grand challenges. Over the years, the foundation has been able to attract almost another $200 million. So we are able to use that money, to leverage that money, to send it out to, to the rest of the world for the grand challenges and, and um, to NIH to do what we've done. So 
If NIH did not exist, the foundation for NIH obviously would not exist. We're very good with our money. The majority of the money, we, we have no endowment, which, believe you me, is a problem for those of you who head foundations. I have no play money. The money that comes into the foundation is money that comes in for a purpose and goes out. So we take very little overhead and we have a very good, um, for those of you who know, this is the highest level you can get for, from Cherry Nav Navigator, which is a watchdog checking to see what foundations do with their money and the four star is the, the highest uh, that you can get. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting model, an interesting group and it's independent of NIH. So the flip side of the coin is NIH cannot come to us to do things that they are not able to do. So for example, now there's severe restrictions for those of you who um, go to study sections, do, sections, you don't get coffee, you don't get cookies, you, you know, water maybe if you're good. Um, and the <laughs> And so NIH cannot come in and, and then say, Foundation for NIH, now give us the money and we'll put all the cookies and the, and, and the coffee there. No, no, it doesn't work that way. We're not a workaround. We're independent, but um, you know, we, we're there to help, but not a workaround. Board of Directors, 28 board members. You will recognize some of the names here. I noticed you had, um, is this a, yeah. I noticed you have an article uh, from about Dita Blair in your package. She's been a member of the foundation since the uh, the inception of the foundation. Ellen Siegel, uh, it's an amazing uh, ball of fire for those of you who know Ellen. If I can package her energy, I'd be I'd have my endowment. I think um, Sherry Lansing from the Sherry Lansing Foundation and Corporation. So it's a really amazing group of people, and Wojcicki, um, 23 and me. So let's um, tell you about my, the projects we have. We have 103 projects under management right now. Those projects cost about half a billion dollars, so are they diff in different uh, parts of development. They, they hit, and this is Andrea Baruchin, um, who's sitting in the back here, a neuroscientist by training and a fabulous, so if you have any questions, I'll direct them to Andrea because I'm here not for not that amount of time. But I said to Andrea, we keep talking of our projects like this, right? So where do they fit? If you look at the drug continuum, where, where do I, our projects fit? So some of them are the malnutrition and enteric disease, for example, is in very early stages. And they really, most of them don't necessarily fit. In, in this kind of, um, of our uh, uh, schematic. But one of our board members said, how does your portfolio uh, fall? And th this is how our portfolio falls. But when you really talk to people, they, they want to know, especially funders and donors, they want to know where, where do you hit in the, in the human body? What's the disease that affects me? I have a family history of melanoma. What are you doing in melanoma or what are you doing in in um, bone or kidney or, can or uh, pancreas, et cetera. So we do have a fairly diverse portfolio when it comes to mapping into the 27 institutes of NIH. But as you know, the 27 institutes of NIH are, will do cancer if you're in, uh, if you're in um, uh, uh, infectious diseases, you know, HPB being a case in point. Lots of lessons. Um, things that we've learned over the years, we've become really, really, really good at doing these partnerships and putting, putting groups together. I can go through these, but I want to spend the next five minutes. Um, what do I see in the next 10 years? So I see that we will change in the next 10 years, and if we think about it, somebody gave me a remarkable um, statistic, and I don't know that it's true, but I, I have to believe it's true. Well, the way that cell phones have changed in the past five years has been amazing. We used to just be able to dial a number five years ago, and now it's become essentially our you know, best and most beloved attachment. So I do think that we're going to see amazing change in the way we understand disease and in the way we understand ourselves. And 
along with the majority of, of um, people that are excited about this, I think the issue in neurosciences and in brain and in Alzheimer's and the diseases that affect um, our, our massive populations are going to be dramatically different. I do see new players in this field, players that I've never seen before. Um, some of you will have heard the term venture philanthropist. Completely different group of people did not exist two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And now they're forced to be reckoned. These people that have made an enormous amount of money that have a particular issue and they're using their money and their smarts to move uh, projects forward. And they're getting together. They're organizing in unexpected ways. And I think we're going to find very different constructs of these matrices and partnerships. I think patients and caretakers are going to become members of the biomedical enterprise. They're not going to be passive uh, acceptance. Uh, they are going to be drivers, and I see that already today. And women in particular are going to have an amazing role here. What I've seen in terms of advocacy for science, what I've seen in terms of taking control of your own health, taking control of your own data, I've seen mostly from women. And when we're talking about educating, as, as um, we heard before, when we're talking about educating a new generation of women, I believe that this is going to be one of the key changes and differences, the role of women as drivers in the biomedical enterprise. And it's going to be global. It's not only going to be in the United States. We're going to see new clinical trials, we're going to see combination therapies, and we're going to see established clinical trial infrastructures around the world. This notion that every time we have a new chemical entity or a new diagnostic or a new um, vaccine, we generate clinical trials uh, specifically for that is going to be passe. I see a global network of clinical trial um, sites that will be very nimble, that will be able to bring in new chemical entities, put them in, and move them forward because we have to change the paradigm of the 10 to 15 clinical trial structure. We're going to see crowdsourcing, we're going to see global challenges, we're going to see more prices in scientific inquiry, we're going to see the the science, the educated scientific entrepreneur, the individual that is going to contribute to this in new and exciting ways. And we're going to see universal health coverage, by the way, and no, not Obamacare. I'm talking around the world. I, I, um, I sit, uh, Jeff Sachs is now just, uh, d working with Ban Ki-moon. Ban Ki-moon has put 60 people together in a room. I'm one of those 60 people to try and figure out what the next challenges for the world is going to be. We had the Millennium Development Goals, and so we're working on the post-Millennium Goals. So what are we doing from 2015 to 2025? And I'm on the health group, and one of the things that we're working on is what do we mean by universal health coverage? Because we do think that that's an issue. Um, around the world, and uh, mental illness is now an unidentified global health consequence. So how do I know? I know because we've already started doing some of this. Um, we just had, in conjunction, the foundation for, these are all projects of ours, but we just had, uh, the, uh, with the foundation, uh, with the Jeffrey Bean Foundation, a very exciting uh, global challenge. We have ADNI which is um, a group of uh, neuroimages from around the world that are put in a common database that scientists can tap and navigate. But we have a lot of information. We just don't know what it means. And so what we've done is we, <laughs> we work with Meryl Comer, who's, by the way, another one whose energy we need to pack. And we decided to put a global challenge out for differences. Brain scans, and is there a difference between men and women brains? And uh, it went global. It went viral. We had 600 work groups, and we had um, 
60 potential algorithms, which is what we were looking for. We had, a three, two, we had three winners, and we had people in the room after we had gotten the global votes for the, for the three groups that we thought were better. We had people in the room with clickers to vote on who the final winners were. I mean, it was amazing. It was awesome. Since when do you decide a science prize by clickers in the room, right? It was in the New York Academy of Science. It was great fun. And so the group from Liechtenstein won. The group from Liechtenstein. Second runner-up was Cornell, was it, um, Andre? Boston. Uh, I, I forget who or I should know. And we didn't have a second prize. So a woman representing Sanofi came up and said, I'll give you another $50,000 on the spot. And that's how the prize was won. So lots of exciting things. I can spend a lot of time, but Carla will probably pull the rug from under me. Um, talking about this iSpy adaptive trial, which was really exciting. Talking about the AIDS vaccine um, center. Talking about mosquitoes as vectors. So lots of public-private partnerships, lots of excitement, lots of good things happening. And um, serving as the engine to do that is kind of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Is NIH the only agent? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is NIH the only agency of the federal government that has a foundation? No, uh, the CDC has a foundation, and it started before the NIH um, foundation had. And the FDA just got a foundation uh, that is it's called the Reagan Udall Foundation. And I found the other, out the other day that, in fact, the USDA has a foundation. And that was, uh, I, we knew about that because they, they, we were taken to Congress to ask how the NIH foundation worked. And they're working on one for NIST. Really? I don't know where NSF is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, yeah. No, we tried it. We tried it yeah. some years back, but it yeah. didn't work. Yeah. Well, Maybe it's the time. Because everybody's talking about these leverages. Maybe it's the time. Yeah. I, I noticed on one of your slides that um, you had discovery, preclinical, and clinical. And, and the preclinical was pretty empty yeah. in terms of projects. This is always a problem in the development, uh, the translational development of discoveries to the clinical side. And it depends very much on venture capital. And perhaps the foundation is the right place to start. This is an idea, not mine, but from a, a, a professor at MIT in the business school. And he was realizing that there's this valley of death that people have called. And that perhaps you could establish a venture capital which would be different from the other venture capitals that we know. We know that people who have enough money will play the game of investing in 10 dis discoveries, and they're lucky if they win and won. Right. Now, if you do the calculations, if you were able to invest in 100 companies, then your chances of having a winner or two or three would be a lot higher. And for the average investor who doesn't have the amount of money that venture capitalists do, it's possible to develop a venture fund hmm. that would allow people with less money to actually to get into in. it and share that risk around in a much bigger way. Hmm. Meanwhile, providing the kind of scientists that the foundation could call on to really vet the company so that there is a professional yeah. background to it. But, uh, but to get a company that would be in a public-private relationship with you to offer and run that venture fund. So um, I'd love that. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I think it's great. I don't know. I know I have this. I, 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 OK, so to be continued, I, I love that idea. Venture philanthropy? Venture, venture philanthropy, yes. But they are usually. 
Yeah, they're us and, they, and they're usually focused on a disease. I think what you're talking about is a pool that's nimble enough that can go follow the great science. I think that's fantastic. I just want to applaud your work, and I really enjoyed your talk. My name is Eleni Tsimas. I'm the director of the Breast Center at Georgetown University, and we're, I'm one of the co-investigators of the iSpy trial. Huh. Um, and for those of us in the room who are not familiar with it, it's for giving patients upfront chemo before surgery, patients with large tumors, and with the addition of additional investigative drugs. And this trial has been so well received. Patients love it. They come from far away for this trial. So I appreciate all your... Wow. Thank you. It's an adaptive trial, too. So what it is, is you actually do it by screening uh, genomic, uh, you know, and, and figuring out which profile fits what drug. So we learn. As the trial goes on, you start learning, and you don't give a person with a certain profile a drug that you know that somebody else has used and doesn't work. So one of the things we're doing is, on, on that trial, we are now, um, uh, there are certain things that a foundation can do, and we can get things started, we can get things moving, getting into a place where it's, um, where it's healthy and moving forward and, and transitioning it out. So part of what I'm doing now is transitioning the iSPY trial so that we can work on the lung cancer protocol, which is our next trial. Uh, and we're just starting that, and it's a mammoth $150 million trial for uh, lung cancer. So I spy is healthy and moving lung cancer and um, you know on its way. Thank you.